Alrighty. Whoa, we are live. I know everyone can hear me. Uh, I want to welcome everyone out to Encounter tonight. Some people are trickling in. I want to welcome all you guys that are here tonight. I want to welcome our friends online. I want to welcome everyone out to the greatest place to be on a Friday night. So grateful that you are here. Uh, again, uh, people who watch online around the country, got a lot of friends that do that. Uh, if you're here for the first time, welcome to Encounter. Uh, if you're visiting for the first time, please fill out uh, a Connect card that you find on the table out there. And uh, if you could turn that in to me, I'll have a gift for you uh, that I want to put in your hands uh, before you leave this place. And if you're wondering, maybe listening online, visiting, maybe you've been to Encounter before. A lot of times I get up here, I don't really talk about what Encounter is because I want you to experience Encounter. Encounter is about you having your own encounter with the living God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, who wants you to encounter him because all it takes is one encounter for your life to be changed, blessed, healed, and set on a pathway of wholeness and healing. So encounter is a ministry that some people come to heal, some people come to grow, some people come to heal and grow, some people come just to go and find out what their calling is and what God has for them. And it's all of that. It's a discipleship, recovery, grace, truth, ministry that never compromises one for the other. Jesus came full of grace, full of truth, full of recovery, full of discipleship. There's no such thing as recovery before discipleship or discipleship without recovery. It's one pathway that he invites us into. And I want to thank you for, you could be doing a lot of things on a Friday night, but you came to encounter. And that says something about you, and I'm so proud of you. We have a great night planned. I mean, we got baptisms tonight. I said we got baptisms tonight. And we have a special guest uh, that's always welcome here. His name is Jesus Christ. And so, uh, and he sent his Holy Spirit. And the Father's looking down. Do we need anything else? Well, we do need fellowship. We do need the word of God. We do need the power of prayer. And those are all the things that encounter in bodies. Let me tell you about a couple things going on uh, before we get started with the service. Uh, the Encounter Bible Study is going to start this Tuesday. Now, if you're on the fence about it, uh, I know some people, I spoke to a courageous friend of mine that said, you know, everything in me told me not to do it, but, I, but I'm going to do it. And that person's overcoming uh, their fears for whatever reason, and they're taking a very courageous step to do that study. If you've done the study before, it's a different study. It's unlike when we used to do the study, when we had the books, the binders, these, the, the whole study's been revised, edited, it's in a book form, plus even if you did the study, you're in a different place now, and your answers are gonna be different because God has something different to tell you. That's what's called, when you hear the scripture that says that the Holy Spirit will quicken our mortal bodies, that the same spirit that lives in us is the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, God wants to give you a different revelation. Did you ever read a scripture for years and it never made sense to you? Then all of a sudden, it means something different to you. That's the Holy Spirit quickening your mortal body so that the scripture means something different to you. I've been reading scriptures for 27 years, and I love the scriptures. But this year, scriptures that I've read for two and a half decades mean something different to me because the Holy Spirit's doing something new in me. And he's giving me a different revelation of what that scripture is. And when you do the, when you do the encounter Bible study, and you pray those prayers over the scriptures. Lord, what are you saying? What are you saying to me? How do you want me to live this out? And you wait to see what God tells you. Listen, all encounter is and all the encounter Bible study is, is you, through the word of God, through the power of prayer, 
getting into God's presence, hearing the voice of God, having the Holy Spirit reveal and rip out the root issues, be transformed by the power of God, and then go out and do what God tells you to do. That's the Christian life. And that's what happens when people come on Fridays, but also do that study. So if you're not signed up for that study on Tuesday, sign up, show up. Tuesday night, 6.30, room 1009 for the women, room 1011 for the guys. That's my public service announcement. Don't let me come after you. Do the study. I'm jacked up on Jesus tonight. I'm fired up. I'm fired up, Whit. I'm fired up. So uh, there's still culinary opportunities to serve. Uh, I want to let you know that uh, next Friday will be unceasing prayer. I'm going to be in here from 5 to 6 praying. I invite you to sign up online to be on my team and pray with me for uh, an hour. Jason is going to be leading us in the all worship night. He's going to have a special word for prayer, uh, a teaching on prayer. We're going to pray together. We're going to pray in groups. Uh, you don't want to miss the all worship prayer night at Encounter. So it's going to be a great night tonight. My buddy Witt is here. Everyone say Thanks, Witt. Thanks for being here. I love Witt. Uh, I'm so grateful uh, that, he, that he helps teach at Encounter. Uh, many of you don't know that Witt baptized me. And when I was just a young scoundrel, I just got saved. And, uh, and one of the things in my first encounters with Witt, uh, I, met, I, I met with a lot of phonies. Witt was not one of those phonies. It was a, what you see is what you get Christian, and I'm so grateful to have him in my life, and I'm so grateful that he's helping us out here at Encounter. Uh, so I'm going to invite the worship team. Are you guys ready? Sean and Julie, uh, you, you guys come on up, and uh, this is the All-American Christian Submarine Band. And <laughs> <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> don't listen to me. I tell you, anything goes on Friday. <laughs> And so, <laughs> this is not the little rascals. And, uh, but I will, I, I will tell you this. Uh, I, I love, as a person who, who was not able to sing, Julie can tell you that, but I love to worship. And I love when we get led into spirit and truth type of worship. So why don't you stand up on your feet? Why don't you prepare your hearts to sing to an audience of one? Why don't you leave everything in your car, any problems, any fears, any pain, any issues you walked in with, because God's going to do a great work. And for all we know, there may be some miraculous healings just during worship. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? So if you only had a few hours to worship your king, what would that worship look like? I have a mindset, and the mindset is this. Whenever we create a ministry event, do it as if one person's life depends on it because you'll never know if you'll be able to see that person again. And when we worship and teach, whatever we do at Encounter, we do it as if one person's life depends on it. We just don't do it just to do it. We do it for the glory of God so that God can do what we can't do for that, for that person or persons that their lives depend on the love and power of Jesus Christ. Thank you for leading us in worship. So as I was coming here tonight, I felt like the Lord was just wanting to pour out his um, just refreshing. Does anyone need refreshing tonight? I felt like I needed that so bad today. And the last couple of days as I've run into people, they have needed it too. And I just felt like the Lord met me in a deep way today to refresh me. So let's just call on his name right now. 
Jesus, we just adore you in this place. We gather around your throne tonight to just enthrone you with our praise, to exalt who you are. And we are so, so thankful for what you've done for each and every one of us and what you continue to do. And thank you, Lord, that we have access now to the Spirit of God that doesn't just fill us a little bit, but you fill all things. And so, Lord, come tonight. Let your waves and your breakers wash over us again. Fill us afresh. Lord, just like Moses said, we don't want to do anything without your Spirit. It's just singing songs. So, Holy Spirit, we say come. Come and freely move in, in our hearts and in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.
There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and I've seen. Tasted and seen of the sweetest of love, when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Oh, we love your presence, your presence.
lips, Lord Jesus, 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 come and consume. Oh, come and consume, God, all oh, we are. We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. We want you. Come and consume, God, all oh, we are. We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. We want you. Come and consume us, Lord. Come and consume, God, all oh, we are. We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. We want you. Consume us, Father. Come and consume, God, all oh, we are. We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. going to continue worship, but I believe this next worship song, I believe the Holy Spirit is asking the question tonight, what do you need to lay down before him? What do you need to surrender to God tonight that you've been holding on to, or maybe something has a hold on you? Maybe it's fear, maybe it's worry. Maybe it's a situation. You don't know what to do with it. And here's a better question. They're going to sing about this. What area of your life, and I believe God is asking the question, that you need to make room for, for him. So I invite you, as we continue to worship, that this is a worship song that requires meeting God face to face, experiencing his presence, and just getting real with him. So I'm going to open up the altar as we continue to worship. Come now. i 
So shake up the ground for my tradition, break down the walls for my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. Yes. Shake up the ground for my tradition, break down the walls for my religion. Your way is better. thank you that you are giving promises back to people that they feel like all hope is gone but Lord I thank you that you're going to have there are going to be incredible ministries 
birthed out of this room. And Lord, testimonies that will literally shake people back to life. And I thank you, God, that you are releasing hope and that you are releasing promises and that you are releasing a holy calling on many in this room tonight. Holy Spirit, seal it. Lord, I just um, come and break the enemy's attempt, Lord, to steal and kill and destroy and trying to take the call of God off of these ones that you are putting your hand upon. So, Lord, I pray that that is a confirmation to them that their hope and their call is secure and that, Lord, you will keep them and that you will help them to move forward. And I pray that in Jesus' powerful name. Which right. coming up, but before Wit, Wit gets ready to preach, uh, I want everyone to turn to the back of the room, look at the lady standing up in the middle. It's Carolyn's birthday, and uh, I want to wish my sweet wife a happy birthday. Uh, it's a birthday. A one, a two. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Carolyn. Happy birthday to you. And many. 39 and still fine. Well, for about a year and a half, I've been coming to an encounter, and I'm going to tell you, tonight's worship down front, listening to you and, and everybody, it was just an awesome, awesome night of worship. I want to say, yay, God. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, Jerry, for leading us to the throne of music tonight. It was awesome, simply awesome. And Bill, thank you for the introduction, but I do have to make one serious correction. He said that I was a person that what you see is what you get. Well, three times in my life, that's not true. I held a secret sin, and it's like living a hell on earth until they became light, and still the dev devastation happened to me and my family and others in the faith. And so I, I, I just pray tonight that if there's any type of secret sin going on in your life, get it out. Give it to the Lord. And um, I'm telling you, you saying that song, His Ways, The Best Ways? Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Okay, now tonight, I need your help. If I say the word, get it, and you really do get it, you say, got it. Get it? Got it. Okay, the next thing, I need a volunteer, preferably a female, that has your purse with you. Now, come on, price is right, come on down. A female that has your purse, good, here we go. All right. Come on up here. Now, I hope people can hear you. All right. T why don't you tell everybody your name? Santana. 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 All right. This is not a plant. I've never spoken to Santana. Is that true? Absolutely. Okay. Well, tonight, here you go. I'll give it back to you. Tonight, I'm going to ask you to do something. And I promise you. I promise that you'll be better off walking off this stage than when you came on the stage. Now, do you believe me? Yeah. Okay. Well, that, was, that wasn't so certain. You, all right, here goes. You bring your purse around. Is there a wallet in there? Yeah. Can I see it? Be careful. Is there any money? No. Nope. What? I needed money for lunch. Okay. Do you have anything, any money in your purse? No. Nope. Okay. How about you got a ring? Any rings? Nope. Okay. You got a phone? Okay. Can I have it? Okay. Anything of value that's in that purse? Uh, nope. No. Nope. Okay. Can I have the whole purse? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Let's give her a round of applause. Go see you. No, come back here. Come back here. Now, being the generous, these are mine. She gave them to me. But I promised you that when you leave here, you'd be better off 
Then when you, yeah, then before you came on. So being the generous person, here's your purse back, and here's your phone, and here's your empty wallet, and here's twenty dollars to buy lunch tomorrow. Just as I promised. Let's give her a big round of applause. All right, now, besides she not being so smart, why did Santana, why did she do what I asked her to do? She trusted. She had faith. She believed that I would keep my promise and that she would be better off when she walked off this stage than when she came on this stage. Two weeks ago, Bill preached about the uh, Anchor One. And he prayed all throughout the service. And anchor one is decide you want to get well. Decide do you want to get well. You do a horrible job at playing God and being in control. That God is in control and not you. And so tonight anchor two is this. Believe, and that's the big word. Believe that God's love and power can restore hope and healing. Anybody in here need hope? Yes. Anybody need healing? Okay. The key word is believe. Folks, believe is much deeper than that. The Satan believes in God. Our belief, I believe in God, but believe is much deeper. It has to do with faith and with trust in God. So the bottom line tonight is this. If you can answer this question, do you believe? Do you have trust? Do you have faith that God is who he says he is and that God will do what he says he will do? Not just believe that, but you have faith and you have trust in it. And here's the problem. We don't get into the Word of God enough to find out what God's really like. We see God through a filter, a lot of us, our personal filter. Our personal filter of pain and hurt. That's how we see God often. Um, our childhood, whether it was good or bad, that's oftentimes how we frame God. Our intelligence or what our peers say, or what the news media says, that's often the filter that we see God. Therefore, we put God in a box. We make God in our image. And so, therefore, he can only do what human minds can believe he can do if we put him in a box like that. Folks, I'm telling you, God gave us a reference point, a filter to see the entire world and your own life through. And that was Jesus Christ. He's the filter that we see everything through. And he left us the word of God for us. The entire Old Testament points to Jesus coming soon. And not, he's not just the main character, folks. He's the point of this book. And he came to demonstrate the love and the power of God. And one of the best ways he does his love and power is the ability to save sinners like you and me. That we move, we move from death to life. We take people who've been contaminated by sin and he cleans us up. You are the clear imitation of God's love and power walking around on planet earth today. And that's why Paul wrote in Romans 1.6, this extraordinary message of God's powerful plan to rescue everyone who trusts him. Jesus and the word of God is to be our filter in the way that we see God and the way that we see our circumstances. Get it? Okay. Well, the Jewish people had a temptation to move away from God. And the author of Hebrews was very wise. He made this powerful observation in Hebrews 12 too. He says this, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Fix our eyes on on Jesus. Now, here's why we can't do it, because we get distracted. There's all kinds of distractions around us. Politics, our world going to hell in a handbasket, our relationship and family problems, our health problems, our work problems, our financial problems, the TV, the computer, all. And the main culprit is our phone and then social media. So many distractions. And the writer of Hebrews, years ago, is saying, today, Fix your eyes on Jesus. So I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Why not wake up every day and say, Jesus, today I am going to follow you in all that I do. What if you woke up every morning and said, Jesus, today 
I'm going to follow you in all that I do. I'm going to follow you in my thoughts, with my hands, my time. I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus, not the church, not Christians, not the way you were raised, not what you were taught or your intellect, not what the news media is saying, not on the preacher, not on your circumstances. You're going to fix your eyes every day on Jesus, and you're going to start getting into the Word of God. And if you do that, the second anchor to believe, to have faith, to have trust, that God's love and power can restore your hope and healing, it will happen. It will happen. It's a promise from God. Okay, so, all right, what's faith? What's faith? Hebrews 11.1, 1, it's called the hall of faith, says this. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. And the people in Hebrews 11, they believed that. They believed that God was who he said he was, even though they couldn't see him, and he would do what he said he would do. And if you read this chapter 11, by faith, so-and-so, by faith, so-and-so, by faith, so-and-so, by faith, so-and-so, this these men and women who were in God's hall of faith, they knew that God kept his promise to Abraham. Now watch this. God told Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. Check. I will bless you. Check. I will make your name great. Check. You will be a blessing. Check, check, check. Hope so became be so, and when that happens, you have confidence. So when does hope so become be so? Well, I hope I get a raise. Well, it's not until the boss comes and says, I'm going to give you a raise. Then hope so becomes be so, and your confidence starts to build when that happens. So every day, wake up and say, I'm going to wake up every day, and I'm going to follow Jesus, and I'm going to get into the Word of God. Okay, now, how many here tonight want to please God? I know I do. I know I do, okay? The Bible says there's one way, one way to please God, and here it is in Hebrews 11:6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You mean I don't please God by going to church? You mean I don't please God by saying these certain prayers or praying all the time? You mean I don't please God by memorizing scriptures or keeping all the rules? Those are great, fantastic things. But he says, the writer in the Holy Spirit inspired said, the only way to please God is by your faith confidence trust faith and that God is who he says he is and that God will do what he promised he will do that's it so let's look real deeper into what faith is hey by the way I heard about two nuns and they were coming back to their convent and they just been on a medical missionary field and they ran out of gas their van ran out of gas and the only container that they had was their a bedpan so the two nuns got the bedpan and marched about a mile down the road to the gas station, filled the bedpan up with gasoline, walked back to their van, started pouring the bedpan of gas into their tank, and back then a, a truck driver started driving by, and he sees his bedpan, then poured it, and they said, Whoa, you women sure do have a lot of faith. Oh, man, that went over like a lead <laughs> balloon. Anyway, I'll strike that off next time. First aspect of faith is this. First aspect is believing when you don't see it. Believing when I don't see it. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith has been sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And then the list goes to men and women who please God by living a life of faith. Abraham, leave your home. Where to? Just pack up and leave. You'll be, you're going to be the father of a great nation. Hey, Gideon, go fight the Midianites. What? God? I've got 300 men, they've got 6,000. You're going to be victorious. And he did. Moses, you go back to Egypt. I can't go back to Egypt. I killed a man there. You go back to Egypt and free the people from bondage. And he did it. They believed God even though they couldn't see the results. We hear a lot of people say this. Yeah, I believe when I see it. No. No, you do it because you believe God is who he says he is. And God's going to do what he promises. 
Um, it, it's like Nehemiah. Come on, we're going to go back and rebuild the, the wall. Joshua and Caleb, urging people, you got to go into the promised land. No, can't do it. And everybody was doubting God but those two. But they couldn't see it, but they, prompt, they followed God and did it anyway. I want to tell you, at the grand opening of, of Disney World, someone turned to Walt Disney's widow and said, wouldn't it have been great if Walt could have seen this? And the widow said, sir, he did. He did see it. He saw it before it happened. This ministry right here on Friday night's encounter, I believe Bill and Carolyn saw a whole bunch of broken, hurting people. And they, he, they were seeing that they were missing an ingredient that these support groups have, which states that you can believe God as you understand him. And, I mean, they could believe in a rock or a chair or a crystal as you understand God. No, it's believing. It's believing in the God of the Bible, not as you understand him. And they knew that. They knew that. Then they knew that a person needed a personal encounter with God. And so this Romans 15, 13 is kind of their life verse in the book that I would encourage you to read and go to that class. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 13. And thus encounter was born from California to Kentucky and it's going to many more places because they had a dream. They couldn't see the results, but they obeyed God to continue and build this ministry called encounter. Another, another aspect of faith is this. Obeying even when I don't understand. You ever been there? Obeying God even though you don't understand? Noah, can you imagine that God says, go build an ark way out in the desert because I'm going to send a flood. I'm going to wipe out everything but your family, you, your family, and some animals. Can you believe that? And he says, rain? It hadn't even rained. What's rain? A flood? What's flood? No, you go out in the desert. You build this big boat. And I'll do the rest. I'm going to send the water to you. Noah had an encounter with God. He obeyed God even though he didn't understand. We've already talked about Abraham, 75-year-old guy, comfortable living, placed near modern-day Ur. He and his wife on Social Security. And God said, Abraham, I'm going to take you on an adventure of your life. Out of you, I'm going to bring a former nation out of a 75-year-old man and an infertile wife. And hang on, hang on. It's going to be 15 years before all this happens. By the way, now listen closely because I bombed on the first one. Did you hear about the 75-year-old woman that had a baby? I mean, her neighbors and her friends were so excited. They couldn't wait to see that little baby. And so the baby came home and they all rushed over to see it. Can we see the baby? No, the mother said, you got to wait. The 75-year-old mother said, no, wait. The baby's got to cry. Then we can go and see them. Well, they waited 50 minutes. Hey, we waited 50 minutes. We got to go. Can we go see the baby? No. When the baby cries, then you can see the baby. Why do we have to wait till the baby cries, she said. Because the 75-year-old mother said, I forgot where I put her. <laughs> Good. God knew that children were supposed to be given to younger people, all right? I'm sure, I'm sure Abraham and Sarah had their doubts and questions. Where are we going? You just follow what I say. Well, I, it's, it's, it was scary. And, it, hey, this isn't small stuff, God says. Abraham said, God, God, we, need, we, we don't understand, but we're going to do it. Abraham and Sarah, now get this, obeyed even though they didn't understand God. Faith is obeying even though you don't understand. Get it? Okay. I did ask my wife, Sandra, one time. I said, can you think of a time that you obeyed God and it didn't make any sense? It took her 10 seconds. Oh, yeah, when he told me to marry you. <laughs> All right, a third aspect of faith is this. Third aspect is this. Giving even when I don't have it. Giving of your time and your talent and your treasures even though you feel like you don't have time and talent or treasures. I did a wedding one time, and the little flower girl was dropping flowers down the aisle. 
she stopped, held up her empty basket, and yelled out at the wedding, that's all I've got. You ever felt that way? With your money? With time? With your treasure? You see, I spent two years in prison, away from my family, and couldn't provide. My wife became a school teacher, had two little kids every morning, get dressed for school, get the kids ready, get them to school, and go teach. Yet she never, never stopped giving to God. Maybe you don't have a job. Maybe you're living on Social Security. Maybe you're working for minimum wage. And you throw up your hands and you say, that's all I've got, God. How am I going to make it? Could it be? Could it be God is saying, who are you going to trust? My promises to take care of you or your ability to take care of yourself? The first, and the reason I'm saying this is the first person in Hebrews 11 mentioned is Abel. Do you all remember Abel? He didn't, make a, he didn't have a great nation come out of him. He wasn't a king. Uh, he, he, he didn't kill a giant. He didn't lead people out of bondage like Moses. He didn't live very long because his brother Cain killed him at a young age. But here's what he did. He simply gave an offering, and he's in the fathers of God, Father God's hall of faith. And it wasn't how much he gave. It was how he gave. Hebrews 11.4 says, By an act of faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice to God than Cain. It was what he believed, not what he brought, that made the difference. That's what God noticed and approved as righteous. Here's what I know. I know Bill and Carol know this too. You can't outgive God. Folks, I minored, I minored in college in math. I've read all kinds of math books figured all kinds of equations out and there's nothing that can explain God's math all I know is by your giving of your time your talent and your treasures even though you don't feel like you've got them by giving them he's going to multiply those things in your life faith is giving even when you don't have it and here's one of the benefits that the Bible says about giving without even though you don't have it it says there is overwhelming joy it feels good to give. And Jesus himself said it's better to give than to receive. I go in restaurants a lot. I used to go in a lot more than I do now. And I sometimes would pay for someone's meal. I'm telling you, I had so much joy when I did that. Just silently left, didn't tell them anything. One time I remember I was at the drive-thru at McDonald's, and behind me was Jimmy Bowling, and he had three or four ki kids in the car. And I gave the waiter, I said, here's two, 20 extra dollars, pay for their meal behind me. I pulled away, and boy, I was feeling great. I got stopped at a stoplight, and he caught up with me. He put, rolled down your window. He said, thank you. Thank you for that. But Whit, you were $5 short. <laughs> but the opposite happened to me the following week. I was at Applebee's, and someone paid for my meal. And I got out in my car, and there was a big honk, and the Johnsons were waving. They were smiling. More, joy to get, more for, joyful to give than to receive. The next day, after Applebee's, I went to Frisch's, and someone paid for my meal in Frisch's. And I got it in the car, and, and the honk, they honked, and the Johnsons' face all lit up because they're the ones that paid. Folks, two days in a row. So the third day, I went to a Lexus store. And I just kind of stood around wondering what's going to happen today. Well, it never did happen, okay? <laughs> Here's what I discovered. It feels so much better. And God is waiting, waiting for you to give. Well, I don't have the money. Or I don't have the talents. Or I don't have the, I don't have the time. Give it and watch God do a work. In your life. Faith is given even when you don't have it. A fourth aspect of faith is this. Persisting even when I don't feel like it. Persisting even when I don't feel like it. You know, our culture will tell you, if you don't like it, just quit. If it feels good, do it. And if it doesn't, don't do it. And I'm telling you, when I used to preach all the time, there, I'll be honest, there are times I didn't feel like preaching. There are times that I got grumpy and grouchy, 
and rude. There are times that I didn't listen to my wife, and that is bad, bad. That's a bad mistake. There's times I wasn't nice to my kids. There's times that when I got up to preach, I wanted to look back at you like a lot of you looked up at me. And Come on, let's see if he can make me smile tonight. I'm not going to clap if my hands are on fire. Either things that I didn't like to do. I don't always like feeling reading my Bible. I don't feel like praying. But I've learned that even I don't feel like it, that's when I need to do it. Bill said that there's a person he knows that says, I don't, I'm not going to go to that study. I'm not going to do it. And then made it switch around I'm going to do it and that person is going to be blessed folks the biggest problem my biggest problem is me and I want to say your biggest problem is you so God help me and God help you and a part of faith is doing the right thing even if you don't feel like it even if you're moody even if you're broke even if you're hurt even if you feel lonely even when nobody is clapping for you, even when you made horrible choices, even when you felt so guilty and ashamed and want to stay away from encounter or want to stay away from church, no, go ahead and go. Hebrews eleven twenty seven 27 says, By an act of faith, Moses turned his heel toward Egypt, indifferent to the king's rage. He had his eye on the one no eye can see, and he kept right on going. The key to persistence is keeping your eyes on Jesus and in the Word of God. Don't keep it on your surroundings. Don't keep it on your obstacles. Don't keep it on whatever's going on. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Now, I'm going to guess that someone in this room tonight feels like quitting. I don't know what you feel like quitting. Could be your marriage. You're ready to give up on school. You're ready to quit your job. You're ready to give up on church. You're ready to quit recovery or encounter. Some of you feel like your health or financial position is hopeless. Many are ready to just throw in the towel and quit life. And maybe, maybe God brought you here tonight to hear God whisper to you, don't. Don't quit. Don't give up. Never, ever give up. It's not too late to get help. It's not too late to start over. God is able. But if you quit, if you quit, he can't help you. Faith is persisting even though you don't feel like it. Get it? Right. right, number five. Another aspect of faith is thanking God before I receive it. Thanking God before I receive it. The story of Joshua in the Hall of Faith, that's 11, uh, Hebrews 11.30 says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven, seven days. Moses led the people out of Egypt, but before entering the promised land, he handed the baton over to Joshua, and Joshua had to go in and overtake one of the most fortified cities. And here's what God said. Here's the battle plan. You march six times around that city, heavily fortified. And on the seventh time, you start shouting, you start hooting, you start praising, you start worshiping God on the seventh time, and those walls are going to fall down. It didn't make any sense to them, but they thanked God in advance. And guess what? The walls fell down. Well, if you wait till you thank God after you get, he answers it. If you, if you thank God after he answers it, that's not faith. That's simply gratitude for what God did to you. Faith is thanking God before you receive it. Here's what Zig Ziglar said. If God tells you to go after Moby Dick in a rowboat, go, take, go and take along the tartar sauce. Right? Getting it? All right, number six, number six. Trust God when I don't get it. This chapter ends in a way that you or I would not write the chapter. These are great men and women of the faith. Noah, Abraham, Moses, Joseph, David, Gideon, Samuel, even the prostitute Rahab. 
They've all accomplished great things through faith, but they suffered bitterly for their faith. Heads were cut off, eyes poked out, flogged, beaten, thrown into prison, stoned, sawed in two, some died by the sword, some drowned. All these awful things happened to these people of faith. And I used to think, I had it tough. No, don't have it tough. There are people now, missionaries that are in prison, missionaries that are killed because of their faith. Trust God even when I don't get it. You see, living by faith, and this is for new believers or people wanting to be a believer, living by faith in Jesus Christ doesn't exempt you from your problems. I mean, you get baptized. I guarantee you, almost guarantee you, in seven days something is going to happen to you that you're going to say, I just got baptized. I just gave my life to Jesus. What's happening now? Things get worse oftentimes when you have your faith in Jesus Christ. Folks, I've got three friends right now. Now listen to this, three friends. One lost her teenage son who tragically died in a car accident four years ago. This month, four years later, her husband, young husband, died. One friend has a spouse paralyzed because all he did was go over and get the mail out of a friend's box that he asked him to while he was on vacation, and he tripped and fell. And the man now is paralyzed in a nursing home. One more. One friend served in a church for years, has taken 26 trips to India, is a really good teacher. His wife left him. He's almost broke, and he's devastated. Folks, all of those three people, they're losing their faith. We don't get it, God. All these years, we've been a faithful believer in you. We don't understand this. Faith is trusting God even when I don't get it, even when I don't understand. These heroes, they all had difficult times in the Bible. But listen to this, Hebrews eleven thirty nine. 39. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. They never got to see the nation that God had promised. They didn't. And how God blessed the other nations. They didn't get to see Jesus Christ coming here on earth as God's plan was. Yet they trusted and they obeyed even when they didn't get to see God's promise come true. You're sitting in a seat now. And you know why? There's a group of people who've gone on to be with the Lord. Who saw a vision of this church expanding. And that people would come and receive the grace of God and their whole lives would be changed. They would be healed. Because of that, because they believed, even though they couldn't see it, they trusted God that this would happen at this church. Anybody can trust God when things are going great. Anybody can give when you've got money. Anybody can believe when the finish line is two inches from your nose. Anybody can believe if you see it. But faith is trusting God when you don't get it. And oftentimes that happens in the valleys, in the darkness, when you can't see it. When you can't understand it, when you don't have it, you thanking God in advance to get through the valley and trusting and trusting. That's the faith that pleases God. There was a woman who lived in this small community. She was well known for her simple faith. She had so many trials, so many heartaches, so many disappointments, but the people could not believe the, the reassuring calmness that she had. Well, another woman had horrible things happen to her, and she wanted to go talk to this lady. And one day, she did get to meet up with the lady. She asked her, what's your secret? You mean, you've had all this heartache. You, you've had a divorce. Uh, you've been abused. Your children disappointed you. You've got cancer. You don't have much money. How are you so happy and content? I heard about your great faith. Is that what it is? And here's what she said. Not exactly. I do have faith, but I am a woman with faith and a big God who keeps his promises and loves me so much. Wow. I hope you and I can say that. The last five words of Hebrews 11. Keep this in mind what you're going through. God has something better planned. God has something better planned. No matter how tough your life is, 
no matter how tough it is now. Don't give up. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Have that personal encounter with God. And he has something better prepared and planned for you. The best is yet to come. Are you getting this at all? Is God speaking to any of you tonight? Let me close with this. We've talked for several minutes now on faith, on trust, and on belief. There's one more. The Bible says this, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love. Love, the most powerful force that's ever been unleashed in the universe. It's from our creator. God is love. And love benefits everyone. This environment right here at Encounter, man, it's filled with love. It's bringing dead people back to life in the waters of baptism. It, it, it's clapping when someone gives their testimony or a miracle has happened. It's being fired up when we see people coming up here kneeling, surrendering their lives to God or calling out to God. As they say. There's love that fills this place when all of this is happening. I'm going to close by reading this letter. And it's written by a man before he was baptized at Southland. Maybe you can find yourself in this letter. My dad was a terrible example of what it means to be a man. He was physically and emotionally abusive towards me, my siblings, and my mom. When I was a teenager, I told everyone who would listen, I'll never be like my dad. I went to college, drank a lot of beer, slept with all the girls thinking that's what men do. I graduated, got a job, started making a lot of money, got married, had two kids, and woke up in my mid-30s and realized I had become my dad. I wasn't abusing my wife and kids, but I was definitely neglecting them. I made any excuse I could make to not be at home, not help with homework, not be at a school functions, not listen to my wife, and not be at church on Sundays. I'm embarrassed to admit it. But I spent more time playing golf, going to Keeneland, hitting an occasional strip club, taking trips with my buddies, scrolling through porn and social media, that I perfected the art of being a self-centered, egotistical, me monster jerk. I actually surprised when my wife, I acted surprised when my wife left me and the kids hated me. But I wasn't shocked at all. The only person to blame was me. A good friend invited me to church. And I've never cried more. I've never felt more freedom in my life. I've apologized to my wife and kids, and I'm slowly rebuilding trust with them. And even if you aren't able to patch, even if we're not able to patch up our marriage, I needed to die. The old me needs to be crucified, and all my bad habits need to be buried. I'm already stopped drinking and gambling and womanizing. But more importantly, I've started following Jesus. I'm reading my Bible, I'm praying, I'm coming to church, and I found out that God loves me so much, a messed up me, he loves. He died for me. I'm meeting with other men, and I want to be baptized. I need a date on the calendar that I can point back and remember that God gave me a second chance. The day I surrendered all of the shame and guilt and pain and anger of my past. The day I became a new man. A different man, a better man, a forgiven man. I want my son and daughter to see what a real man looks like. I want to see them how a real man behaves. I want them to think about Jesus when they think about me. There's a lot of work to do before that happens. But I have hope, and I believe God will help me. All those parts of faith we talked about tonight is in this man and the way he's acting. And that is is anchor to believe trust have faith that God's love and power can restore hope and healing I hope you want that tonight let's stand as we pray Heavenly Father I pray that you will increase our faith tonight because your word says without faith it's impossible to please you. I believe everyone in this room wants to please you, Lord. 
God, give us, give us courage to speak to every mountain in our lives, the doubt, the fear, the insecurity, the addictions, the hurt, the finances. And we see each one removed in Jesus' name. Give me the courage to do that. Lord, help me with my unbelief. Stretch my faith that no mountain or problem can be bigger than you. Forgive me for not telling you, but telling my mountains how big my God is. Holy Spirit, open our eyes and our heart that we can be filled with the confident hope and the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Give me the desire, the passion, God, to know you, the God of the Bible. I do believe, I know people here believe, may our trust and our faith get stronger, that you, God, you are who you say you are, that your God would do what he promised he will do, and that life is so much better doing it God's way. Help us, Lord, tonight. Lord, thank you for your love that saved a wretch like me. Thank you for your power that raised Jesus from the dead. And Father, I pray that we're not going to quit, that we've got hope. We're going to be healed, and we can have a new start because I believe, and I trust, and I have faith, and I have the love of God in my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Well, before we close in worship, we're going to experience a few baptisms, and if you guys are ready to, or on the schedule to get baptized, why don't you make your way over here, and if you're in the worship center, why don't you move a little closer and celebrate this uh, holy moment that we're going to experience with some of these, with some of these men. And so we're going to do it right away, uh, right now. And uh, first one up, come to the water, whoever's ready. Tell everyone who you are. My name is William Bullock. Everyone say hi, William. Hi, William. Well, William, this is a big moment in your life. It's a moment that heaven's looking down. There's a picture and a scene in the Bible. When Jesus got baptized, heaven opened up. And the Father spoke. And he said, that's my son, who well, I'm well pleased. I believe that when we give our lives to Jesus and we take that next step, because the Bible says repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of eternal life. Because you have Jesus in your heart and it's your desire to live for him, I truly believe that heaven is open and the Father's looking down on you. What a big smile. And heaven's proud. Your family at Revive is proud. The family at Encounter is proud, and this is a holy moment, and we couldn't be more proud. So just repeat after me. Say, I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. I've accepted him. I've accepted him. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. As my desire. My desire. To live for him. To live for him. All the days of my life. All the days of my life.
I'm Steven. Everyone say hi to Steven. Well, Steven, it's a big moment. Yes, sir. Evan's proud. We're proud. It's a big deal to say, I'm going public with my faith because Jesus said, if you'll acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. If you won't acknowledge me before men, I won't acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. Not only are you being acknowledged, because of this step of faith that you've accepted Jesus Christ in your heart it's a big deal it's a big deal and we're so proud of you I mean come on let, let's give it up repeat after me say I believe I believe that Jesus is the Christ that Jesus is the Christ the son of God the son of God and I've accepted him and I've accepted him as my personal Lord as my personal Lord and Savior and Savior. And it's my desire. And it's my desire. To live all the days of my life. To live all the days of my life. For Him. For Him. And him alone. And Him alone. Come on now. On that profession of faith, it's an honor to baptize you. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Death, burial, resurrection. Anybody grateful? Anybody grateful? I'm grateful that if anyone is in Christ, the old is gone, the new has come. So please don't leave. Let's close out. Let, let's let gratitude overwhelm our hearts for what we experienced tonight. So let's close out our service with worship. Take it over, Sean. All my words fall short. I got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do But every song must end
up a big shout tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Let me leave you with one final word. Uh, Why don't you just uh, let the guys know who got baptized how much. uh, Wasn't that amazing? That's just so sweet. Whit, thank you for an on-time message. Sean and Jerry and Julie, thank you for an unbelievable night of worship. Uh, Let me leave you with this final word. Uh, to bless you. It's probably one of my favorite words in the Bible is found in this passage in Hebrews, uh, found in chapter 10. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, Jesus Christ, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. And here it is. I love this word. Let us hold unswervingly. I had my dog in my car today, and I'm a New York driver. He was all over the car. But he was holding on. And isn't that a great picture of faith? That when times get rough and rocky, it says, let us hold unswervingly. We can get bounced and tossed around, but we need to hold on to Jesus. When we don't understand it, when we can't see it, man, that was a word tonight. Let us hold unswervingly, here it is, to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful and then let's do this for each other and let's consider how we may spur one another on toward loving good deeds let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching thank you for worshiping with us you've experienced a glorious night in the Lord. Come back and see us next week. God bless you.
Give them heaven this week. They don't like it, tell them how to get there. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.